I've gone through with a lot of stuff that I didn't realize I had. I'm convinced that I'm like, you know, like, um, I have a yeah, you're like maybe not supposed to go through and raise it. Yeah. But I don't think I've ever flown. Okay, everybody, I propose we get to start it. So, welcome everybody. I don't know about you guys, but I'm super looking forward to today because we're going to put so much extra puzzle pieces in their place. Because if you remember from last week, we started with some vocabulary for special relativity, and yes, we derived two rules. But if you apply the rules, and sometimes you get into a situation where it looks as if things are contradicting each other, right? And in the both the tutorials, I mentioned that is because we don't have the full playbook yet. We want to derive two rules, but there's more rules to derive. And if you put everything into place, then you will find that there's no paradoxes, no contradictions, but you have to be ridiculously careful on how you apply these things. And this is why in both the tutorials last week I said make sure that you always write down which events you are looking at as seen by which observer. If not, you get confused. Obviously delta t is not the same in all coordinate systems anymore, that's one. And secondly, you have to be clear what delta t are you referring to, not who is measuring it, but which process are you looking at, because that might shift in one in exercises, yes? In the simple exercises, there's only one process. So there should be only two delta t's, one for one observer and one for the other observer. But in more complicated exercises, you will find that there's more than one process going on. You have to be extremely careful to see which process is going on. So therefore, always write down your events and such. Now, um, we are going to derive the full rule book today, the whole Lorentz transforms. And yes, that means the paradoxes that we have seen and you will see next week can be solved if you have the full set. So that is our really our learning goal for this week. And as a bonus, we automatically get this loss of simultaneity. We mentioned it last week, that there is something like this. And you can see it if you find a good thought experiment, a good Duncan experiment. But we can also derive the formulas. They automatically come from the Lorentz transform, which is why put in between brackets. And all of this we're going to do by, yeah, what, for lack of a better word, what I'm going to call the real derivation of special relativity. Okay? So that is the plan for today. Now, um, maybe it's good that we focus one last time, just as an introduction, to the paradox that we encountered in one of the exercises of last week, namely exercise 4.7. Yeah? I gave you the whole written solution to it. So in principle, that should be enough for you to understand how that works. But because it's such a beautiful lead into what we're going to do today, and I really want everybody to be on the same level when we start this lecture, I want to go through the exercise one more time. I'm going to skip some steps, just going to give you immediately the numbers and focus just on the physics, okay? So, that's the plan. Do you remember the exercise? Mm -hmm. I hear one more. Okay, that's good. Sun, Sun G, Lisa. yeah, rocket. <coughs> this was the exercise. We had two stars or star systems or so. And the distance between the two systems was... 20 light years. 20 light years. Do you know the numbers by heart, really? No, I just remember. No, that's good. <laughs> 20 light years, C years. And what we also had was a spaceship. And the spaceship was moving towards Gliese with a velocity of 3 fifths, which is the speed of light. That was the exercise. Now, um, one question that we had to answer was, how long does it take for this guy to get all the way over there? And obviously, because from relativity, that means there's two systems to consider. One, the Sun and Gliese system. That's all one inertial system, because the Sun and Gliese are at rest with respect to each other. And there was a system, the coordinate system from the spaceship. And for both, the numbers should come out differently, because, well, this is relativity. This is what we now know from a uh, time dilation. Now, if you recall, the amount of seconds that it takes, or the amount of years that it takes in the sun frame to go from the sun to Gliese, it was just simple high school physics, right? The amount of time as seen in the sun system is, well, if you're going to use your high school physics, then you know it's the amount of distance traveled in the Gliese system, you have to forgive me by the way, I have a little bit of a fever, so uh, you see me 
sweat a little bit, it's because of that. Don't feel sorry for me, I'm fine. But let's see if you can do even though you had a fever, okay? It's like a fever dream, actually, if you think about it. It's, it's complicated stuff. Now, so the distance here, you can just simply calculate, or the, the time needed, you can simply calculate by using your high school physics. Why? Because this number you, you get from one quarter system, the sun system. This number is in the sun system. Use your high school physics. And the number that came out was 33 one third year. All right? Then the next question was, okay, but how long does it take for the people in the ship? I'm going to call it bucket, not to confuse it with uh, you know, this label S for ship and or sun skull bucket. Yeah, and this is where you could use now your, your time dilation formula. You just had to place the gamma correctly. So do you remember where the gamma went and for what reason? <coughs> To the rocket because it sees both events happening at the same location. Indeed. And of course, it's the right argument that you always have to write down if you write your exams and if you make your own exercises. Um, you look at the two events. The events being the, su the ship leaves Sun and the Sun arrives at Gliese. For the ship, those two events happen at the same location, namely at place zero in the ship frame. And from the derivation of last week, that means that the amount of time as seen by the ship, that one gets the gamma. Now this number we know, right? that was the 33 one third year. Uh, this number gamma follows directly from three fifths of C, that's five over four, delta T rocket. And then from this you found that delta T rocket was uh, 26 two thirds, I think. Mm -hmm. I'm not calculating, I'm just remembering. 26 two thirds, right? This by itself is not a paradox. This is just really relativity. Now, before we continue, let's visualize this. Let's just play it out. Here's Sun. That's this wall. And that wall is Gliese, and I'm the ship. Okay? I'm moving towards Gliese. Moving, moving, moving. Keeping track of time. Blah, 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 blah. I arrive. There we go. And now I watch my clock and see how long has it taken me to get here. Now, that answer is this number. It took me 26 years. Now, if you're going to ask the Sun or the Gliese people how long did it take me to make that distance, they will say 33 years, right? That was the whole time dilation thing. No paradox there. This is just relativity. It's strange, but this is apparently what nature does. Uh, again, to visualize this a little bit, that means that if I would have left here and I would have had an identical twin over there, I don't have one, but suppose that I did, we are at the same age at the moment that I start moving from the sun, and that guy is already at Gliese. By the time that I get there, that means 40 years that I, which I was when I started, plus what I measure 26 years, that means by the time I arrive, I'm 66 years old. My twin, however, will at age 33 years. So I am younger than my twin is at the moment that I arrive. Okay? So it's good I can laugh at my twin now. Look, look, you're old. <laughs> By the way, I'm also old too. 66 is uh, <laughs> well, getting there. So th this is what happens. No paradox yet. <coughs> the paradox, if you recall, came from the idea, well, what if you're going to ask me what time it is at the sun at the moment that I arrive? And then, via some calculations, we found that if you, would, if you were to ask me at the ship what time it is at the sun at the moment that I arrive, that number was 21 years and one-thirds. Yeah? Note that is not this delta t. Delta t is what time the sun itself thinks that I have traveled, how long I have traveled. The 21 one-third year is how long I think that the sun thinks that I have traveled. Yeah? Yeah, this is where things get slippery. But there's a difference between the two numbers. They don't mean the same thing. This is why, in principle, why there's also no paradox. We're not talking about the same thing. Now, this has to do with the laws of simultaneity. As follows. If I were to stand here, and you know what? Let's introduce a third twin, triplet, <laughs> who was still at the sun. And suppose that he and I can communicate with each other. We can, but you know that takes travel time. Forget about the travel time. Yes. Yes, in principle, in practice, that there is travel time. You have to take that into account. Let's just assume, for the sake of conversation, that I can instantaneously talk to a guy. This does not detract from my actual physics. 
This is just because I want to tell a story that makes it easier for you to visualize. I want to show you where exactly where the paradox and the less loss of simultaneity is. So let's, for the sake of argument, say that I can immediately talk to that guy with no travel time whatsoever. I'm over here, yes? And I say, hey, triplet guy, over there, the other wolf. You should be 21, one-third years older than uh, when I left, right? That guy will say, uh, actually it's 33. This is the paradox. There's no paradox in the traveling guy and one of the two people disagreeing, that's just, that's just relativity. The paradox is, if you look at the amount of time for the same observer, and don't, then those two numbers don't agree anymore. This is the paradox. You would expect that if you would calculate everything back to this guy, you would expect either to get 33 or 21 uh, one third, but you would not expect two different numbers. This is the paradox. And even if you go back to one system and one system alone, then you have two numbers to, that do not agree. So I'm standing over there. I instantaneously talk to that guy and I say, how long did it, uh, to, according to me, you should have measured 21 years. And that guy says, no, it was 33, all right? That means he and I are in disagreement. And that means he and I are going to talk. We're going to talk, where does the difference come from? Here's what the guy will say. He will ask me, when exactly did you measure my clock? I'm standing over there. I should have brought a real twin, actually. It's <laughs> easier. And I will say, well, I measured when I arrived. This is when I did my measurement of your clock. And then that guy asked me, okay, how, how much distance did you travel to get there when you did your measurement? And I will say, what is the number, by the way? What would I say? Oh, 16 yes. light years. 16 light years, yes. It's not 20. 20 is my original second triple that was standing here. He's out of the conversation right now, okay? But if you would ask him, how long was the travel? How many meters? He will say 20 light years. But to me, the traveling guy, it was Lorentz contract, and if you would do the exercise, it was 16 light years. So that guy asked me, where were you when you did my measurement? I say, at 16 light years. This is when I started to look at your clock. Then that guy will say, 16 light years. Shouldn't you have measured at 20 light years? Didn't you measure too early? According to this guy who was standing all this time with Sun, he has seen me travel towards Gliese, made a measurement at 16 light years, then moved on a little, and only then arrived. This is what the guy over there says. Do you see that there is a loss of simultaneity there? The traveling guy says, no, no, no. My arrival and my measurement of your clock, I did at this exact same moment. And that guy said, no, 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 no. You did your measurement at 16 light years. Uh, sorry, you, uh, yeah, you did your measurement at 16 light years, but you only arrived at 20 light years. Your measurement did not, you did your measurement before you arrived. So that guy will say, obviously, your number for my time came out wrong. You measure too early. Yeah? This is why there's really no paradox. Because the traveling guy has done everything correctly. He arrived, turned around, did the measurement, and used his high school physics, no problem. This guy over there is also right. He says, no, 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 no. I see you measure me at 16 light years and then arrive at 20 light years and your measurement and your arrival did not happen at the same moment. <coughs> the whole issue here is that the two observers do not agree on whether the arrival at Gliese and the measurement of that clock happened at the same time, at the same moment. That is the loss of simultaneity. That also means that we can solve this paradox. I gave you the, uh, uh, the solution, but maybe it's good to uh, look through it one more time. And from that moment on, I can show you a much easier way to do the same exercise, okay? So, everybody's clear on the, what the problem is? Okay, good, we're going to solve it. Here's this guy, the sun. He will say, okay, I now know why we got the wrong, why we got different numbers. To me, you measured at 16 light years, and, uh, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, you measured 16 light years and only and 20 light years, this is when you arrived. So, he will say, the amount of time that you are missing 
should be the time that you should have still traveled before you arrived. This guy, the sun, is going to figure out how many years was the traveling guy too early in his measuring of my time. So let's put that in writing. You might recognize this because I'm really just following my solution that I sent you. But again, it's very important that we all are at the same level. So, what you have here is the amount of time Sun as yes. This is a number that the traveling guy says that passed at the sun. What was that number? Twenty one point three 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 three. Yes. This number is twenty one one thirty here, yes. This is the number that the traveling guy tells the sun people. This is how much I think your clock has passed, 21 one through here. But, again, the guy the sun says, but you measured too early. <coughs> so you should compensate for you having measured too early. So here is the amount of time that ship people measured too early. Yes. This is the mistake that the some people think that the ship people made. So if we can calculate this number. And this again is from the sun's perspective. Yes. Good. If we calculate this number, so we're going to compensate for the mistake that the ship people made by measuring too early. If we find this number and we add it to 21 one third, what should the answer be in order for, to, for there to be no paradox? 33 33. So this is going to be your check. If indeed, as I say, the mistake is that the ship people measure too early, then obviously if we're going to correct for that mistake, and we add the, set the amount of years measured too early to what the ship people have measured, we should get back the sun amount. If that is the case, then obviously this was the mistake all along. The mistake. Yes? Question, how to get this number? I really, I'm really just checking if you read my notes. It's fine if you didn't, but we, we have to go through this. How do you get this number? How do you find the amount of seconds? As you can say that they still need to have, they still have to travel four light years, and then you can calculate how much time would it take. Um, Uh, and then you can yes. lower and transform this. Okay, I agree. Now, how many light years too early did the ship measure? Four. That was four. Okay. Good. Okay. <coughs> so, um, Uh, yeah, no, of course, that's correct. Just checking my notes for a second. Oh, no, actually, it's, it's not exactly correct. I'm sorry. No, 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 it's not four. No. I was looking at the numbers, I think something is off. No, it's not four, actually. No, there's a little, there's a, a small subtlety there. Who says I measured at 16 light years? Was the ship people or the, the sun people who said that? Ship. 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 Was the ship people. Now, do 16 light years look like 16 light years to the sun people? Nope. No. They're shorter, right? If the ship people say, I was at 16 light years when I did my measurement of your clock, then to the sun people that wasn't at 16, it was Lorenz contracted. That's an important point. 
So the ship people measured as seen on their own meter six at 16 light years. But the 16 light, year, light years don't look like 16 light years to the sun people, they're Lorentz contracted. So it's a shorter distance. So what is the, let's calculate that first. What is the amount of light years that the sun people think that the ship people measured? 12.8. Why is it 12.8? Um, because you need to, um, one over gamma length of the ship is length of the sun. Okay. It's basically wh what you're saying is that whenever we switch perspective, it goes down by one? Uh, yes, by, by, by gamma factor, yes. And you can do that, I mean, you can do that indefinitely, and at some point you'll yes, approach you zero then? And you can, then yes, but you have to keep, keep, keep in mind the losses I would make. We'll get there. So, in order to calculate this number, let's make this a small side note. When did the ship people measure the time at the sun? According to ship people, they will say when we traveled, 16 light years. Yes? Then the people at the sun will say, <coughs> your 16 light years looks shorter to me. It's not 16. So the sun people will say, when you measure it wasn't at 16 light years, it was Lorentz contracted smaller. This Lorentz contraction that I'm applying now. If you do this calculation, it's 12.8. Okay. When I was talking before, when I was set up the exercise, I said 20 light years minus 16. I was making a very basic mistake that I was warning you against during the tutorials. I'm taking 20 light years in the sun frame and I was subtracting 16 light years in the ship frame. Cannot do that. First, I have to make everything in sun frame. That's what I'm doing now. So, how many light years do the sun people say that the ship people still had to travel? 7.2. It's 7.2 light years. So the sun people say that the ship people still have 7.2 sea years to go. To the sun people, the ship people measured 7.2 light years too early. Good. Now we're so ridiculously close because what we wanted to know was the amount of time that it takes for that last stretch to be traversed as seen from the sun. How, many, how, how much was that? It should be very easy. You mean the amount of time that they still need to travel? Yes, because years. that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the compensation, right? They measure too early the ship people. So the some people say you have to compensate for the fact that you were too early. How many years were they too early? Twelve. Well, no, twenty minus this, right? Because this is the yeah, moment that's that a seven the yeah, so sure, that's a seven oh. two. Yes, yeah, that's yeah. correct. Yes, but how many years do the some people say that the ship people still have to travel before they should have done their measurement? That's 7.2 light years. How much time is that in the sun frame? 7.2 over the velocity. Correct. And the velocity was 3 fifths. Guess what comes out? 12. You do the calculation, it's 12. <coughs> so, 12 how much the, sh the sun people say that the ship people should have compensated plus how much the ship people say that they have traveled is exactly the 33 that the people at the sun said that they had on their watch. No paradox. The only mistake that they made was that the ship people measured too early and then the sun people say you should compensate for your too earliness. And that's this amount if you just do your high school physics. And then you see, oh, but then we agree. If you compensate for your mistake of measuring too early, then both of us say it took 33 years. No paradox. Slippery, yeah? Now, this is what I wrote you in my notes. 
I, you really have to, if you haven't quite understood it, I understand, because your mind is fighting against constantly going back and forth, different systems, and constantly having to correct for time dilation and such. The reason that I bring this up is because of this loss of simultaneity that is at the heart of this. Forget about the numbers, right? I consider this now a solved matter. Forget about the numbers. Let's look at the physics. This guy, the triplet guy, asking now the traveling one, I'm no, again, not forget about the numbers, he's asking the traveling guy now, did you measure your arrival at Greece and your measuring of my time, did you do that at the same moment for you? And then the ship guy will say, yes, that to me, I did it the exact same moment. At the moment I arrived at the other wall, this is when I looked. Okay? But in the relativity, there's lots of simultaneity. What happened at the same time for the ship guy is not at the same time as for the traveling guy. It's 12 years apart. It's 12 years apart, yes. So if you would have just, if you didn't know about loss of simultaneity, you would have thought there's a paradox because it's 33 versus 21. It's a 12 year difference. But if you then say, oh, no, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. They don't agree on what happened at the same moment. And you put that back in, no paradox at all. Most of the paradoxes in special relativity ultimately boil down to not properly taking into account the loss of simultaneity. So next week we're going to do many exercises where things like this pop up. And sometimes you really have to think very cleverly on how, how to correct for this. Now, we actually calculated the loss of simultaneity. It was this number, 12 years, right? But we really had to think five times to make sure that it worked. Even when I did the exercise, and trust me, I do relativity every day, even I, doing it in real time now, momentarily made a mistake. It's very easy to make a mistake like that. Now, what the book does is it, it gives you a formula, a loss of simultaneity formula. It looks like this. You're free to write it down, but we're going to rewrite it. This is the loss of simultaneity formula, where delta x stands for how much distance was there between one event and the other. So is that, in our case, then 20 light years? Yes. Or? Okay. That's 20 light years. Gamma is gamma, V is V, and if you would every, put everything in, you would get minus 12 years, which is correct, because you measure 12 years too early. That's the minus. Okay? The book derives this formula for you. But I promised you I would clearly point out where I'm going to diverge a little from the book. This is one of those cases. They derive it in Chapter 6, but in Chapter 6, the way that they do it is by thought experiments. And as you know from last week, I'm not a fan of thought experiments. They bring you to the right formulas, but with caveats, that's one. But secondly, they do this by making a thought experiment where travel time is taken into account. Yes, because if you want to know what happens over there, in my story it was instantaneous, just for story purposes. But if you actually want to do the measurement, you have to take into account that before you know that you were 12 years early, some light had to come to you to tell you that you were 12 years early, and that complicates the matter. Yes? The effect exists, but this is not the loss of simultaneity. There is no travel time thing. But in order for the book to get you to the travel time formula, that one, they make a thought experiment where they are necessarily having to take into account travel time. And I think that obscures the matter. That gives you the impression that this effect has to do with travel time. It does not. So feel free to read it in the book. It's not incorrect, but it does, might, you, you might get confused because you might get the impression that travel time of light has something to do with it. It does not. So, now we're going to start here. Everybody clear so far? I'm going to erase all of this. Oh, I, I'm speaking of time, I need a timekeeper. I don't have time. So <coughs> somebody needs to tell me when we're about one hour in. 34? Yeah. It's 34 now? Really? We're already one hour in? No, no. no 30 minutes. minutes. Oh, Jesus. Yeah, of course. If, you know, I could make a relativity joke that this is why I cannot look at clocks and do it correctly. <laughs> but unfortunately, none of us are moving too much with respect to each other. I would not get away with it. Too, too good. Then I will take half an hour to get to, to do this one. Then in the second half, we will re-derive. We will... The uh, in a second, we'll do the Lorentz transforms, and then I will show you how this formula that I wrote down for the, for the last time to me, how that naturally comes out. Good.
Let's briefly look back at last week. The derivation of last week. <coughs> Took this as a starting point. Yes. Invariance of the speed of light. So that means, in no matter what inertial system you are, you will always measure the same speed of light. Everything that we've seen, all the formulas that we've seen, directly come from this. We have thought experiments. You put in this requirement, and then you find indeed Lorentz contraction, time dilation, and yes, also loss of simultaneity. Uh, we also did some exercises last week that if you would let go of this. Uh, statement, then you would get delta t is delta t in all systems and lengths are lengths in all systems. Okay, So it's really everything that we've seen hinges on this one. I'm going to throw away this one. Forget about it. I'm going to start with a new postulate, a new starting point. And the new starting point is the following. going to be words in here that we're going to build up during the course of the next half hour. Not the speed of light is an invariant, but this new thing that I haven't introduced yet. The Minkowski line element. Now what the hell is the Minkowski line element? Well, the Minkowski part is not that hard. That was actually Einstein's math teacher. Einstein came up with the theory of relativity after he had already graduated school. I told you last week that he derived all these rules of special relativity in his spare time while working as a uh, clerk. Literally in his spare time, in the evening hours, I said, no, oh, might as well, you know, derive, uh, we derive all uh, space and time rules. Um, he had a secretary at the patent office where he worked, type it out, then he sent it in, got an article, and, uh, well, he should have gotten the Nobel Prize for this, but the Nobel Committee decided that it was too, too strange. <laughs> Suppose that it is wrong. You have to subtract the Nobel Prize. So instead what they did, this is by the way 1921, so uh, 15 years later after Eisen published this, what uh, the Nobel uh, Committee did, they gave him the Nobel Prize, obviously for this, but they said for his services to theoretical physics. Now you usually get a Nobel Prize because you found formula X or because you measured Y. And they said, well, because you, you did service to theoretical physics, here's a Nobel Prize. The real reason was this, okay? And he, uh, but they didn't want to admit it because they were afraid that suppose that in 100 years from now it turned out to be wrong. Then you can still say, well, it wasn't for this anyway, it was for his services to physics. <laughs> <laughs> but he got the Nobel Prize. Now, th this he did when he was a patent uh, clerk <coughs> in an office somewhere in his free time. And then his old math teacher from the university, a guy called Herman Minkowski, looked at Einstein's results and thought, wait a minute, there's something there that looks like geometry. Einstein built it up from the speed of light, but there is some geometry in there. Now what do I mean by geometry? In order to tell you what I mean by that, I'm going to make a small side note. Forget now for just a moment about special relativity, let's just think about Euclidean geometry. Euclidean geometry is just the rules of space and time, or it's, uh, no, forget about time, the rules of space, in every normal day life, yes? I am going to take, well, there we go. I'm going to take my distance towards you, yes? I'm going to construct a coordinate system. In fact, let me stand here. This is zero point of my coordinate system. This is x, that's y, x, y. What is the distance? Do you have to take a guess? Uh, x plus y squared, As in, <laughs> sorry, x squared plus y squared. Yes, and then take its square root. And then its square root. Yeah. Obviously, yes. Because for me, in order to get to him, what I have to do is walk a certain amount of meters in x direction, then make a 90 degree angle, walk a certain amount of distance in y direction. So in other words, I would measure how many meters I would ha have to walk in x direction, in y direction, <coughs> and then the rules of our usual sp space tells us, well, this must be the distance. Agreed? No problem there. I told you, it's all high school physics, relativity. Now, I'm going to do something else. Same zero point, yes? I'm going to step two meters in this direction. Has the distance changed? Yes. Yeah. All right. Now I'm going to do the following. Same zero point, I'm going to rotate my coordinate system. 
you're now exactly on my x-axis okay how do I calculate the distance from me to you? It's still on the same way. Yes. Like it's just that the y zero. happens to be zero, right? Yeah. Now, suppose that I would have taken some arbitrary angle, uh, like this or something like that, or somewhere in the middle. Do you see that no matter how I turn my corner system, I can always find our distance by using Pythagorean's theorem? Even though from one corner system to the next, the value along the x-axis has changed. Agreed? Or the, by the way, the same for the y. I mean, the y is now, I don't know what it is, three meters or so, and now it's literally zero meters in the new coordinate system. So apparently, you can rotate your coordinate system, and that means the x will change from, from one coordinate system to the next, and the y will change from one coordinate system to the next. But the combination x squared plus y squared will have stayed the same. Yeah? That's a property of space, this space. It doesn't matter how you put your coordinate system. X squared plus Y squared will come out the same number, even though X has changed from one system to the next and Y has changed from one system to the next. So one can say, in Euclidean space, Pythagorean's theorem is invariant. It mm. doesn't matter how you change your coordinate system. This side will always have the same length. Invariant just means the same from one corner system to the next. I'm not telling you anything that you didn't know, right? This is just really just, again, high school physics, really. Now, that's interesting. Because, in fact, let me make the drawing a little bit more. Let's make a red corner system now. And in the Just trying to think of a other way of putting it. So in the new coordinate system, so there was the black original one, and you see that the red one has moved with a certain angle up there. Do you see that the x in the black original system, I'm just making up a number now, but suppose that it was four, yes? And the y in the original black system, again, just making up numbers is three. Now let's go to the red system. How much is x? Well, how much is y? Zero. That's zero. And here's some number, yes? And yes, this number is just the original x squared, the black x squared, plus the original black y squared. Now, what is the important part here? Apparently, you can rotate as much your coordinate system as you want without changing the distance, but it has a physical impl implementation, because that means you can trade in a certain amount of y, you can make y go from 3 to 0, but you have to compensate by making x a bigger number. You can trade in x at the expense of y. Again, stuff that you already know. This is a property of Euclidean space, and if you want, want to bother your philosophy professor asking why this is the case. Should have, there's no reason why this space should obey this rule, right? But apparently it does, you can measure it, and we stick to it. Now back to Minkowski, back to relativity. I asked you to forget about it for a bit, I'm going to go back now. Minkowski looked at Einstein's formulas, and he thought he saw the time dilation, Lorentz contraction, he said, wait a minute, there's something that looks like this Pythagorean theorem in there. He said, suppose that you don't have two people, you have two events, something that happens in time and in space. I always think about exploding firecrackers. One firecracker explodes here, and another firecracker explodes there. This is the amount of distance between the two exploding firecrackers. And you know what? Along this axis, we have the amount of time in between. So let's make it explicit. I'm going to take you again. You have a firecracker in your hand. Don't have firecrackers in your hand, people, but suppose that he does. I have one in my hand, and it explodes. Bang. Two seconds later, at you, another one explodes. That means, in this example, the difference between these two events is two seconds in time, and there's a certain amount of distance in space, four meters or so, whatever it is. Okay. It sort of looks like this picture that we had before with x and y. It's instead of that I replace y by time. 
And then Minkowski thought, the scientist, he thought, maybe you can play the same game. Maybe you can rotate to a new coordinate system, where all of a sudden the amount of meters has increased at the expense of the amount of time. Just like Pythagoras' theorem. Now, Newtonian people would say that's ridiculous because the amount of time between two exploding firecrackers should be the same for everybody. But since Einstein, we know that is actually not true. There could be a different number. So Minkowski thought maybe maybe I can find the geometry, the, the Pythagorean theorem that makes that work, and he found it. I'm going to write it down. Yes. So the idea is, is literally the same as in Euclidean space. Let's find some rule that connects the x in black space and the t in black space to the x in, in, in red space and the t in red space. What is that rule that makes that invariant? And Mikoski thought, or he found out, it's actually this one. It's like Pythagoras zero but with a minus sign. And if you, this is just one dimensional in space, but like, let's make it three dimensional. Minkowski thought, or he found out, if you use Pythagoras' theorem, but put a minus sign in between the amount of time and the amount of space, then you get exactly the rules of relativity back, all of them. This thing gets a name. Guess what we call this? Well, we call it Well, guess what we call the thing in, in speech? It's already on the board. This, by definition, this combination of the amount of time and the amount of space is called, by definition, the Minkowski line element. Minkowski because it was Minkowski who found out that it works like this, and line element because in geometry this is what you call this. Pythagoras, the, 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 uh, the diagonal side of a triangle you call the, the line element in geometry. So, what did Minkowski find out? He found out that if you assume that in space and time, not just space, but in space and time, you have Pythagoras' theorem and an amount of time, but the time comes with a minus sign, then this outcome, that number, should be the same for all observers. So the invariance of this number, that is going to be our new starting point. It's more abstract, right? Because the speed of light being the same for everybody, although it is difficult and hard to imagine, at least you know what the speed of light is. But now I'm just putting everything into this one formula. Now you're multiplying every. It's probably going to be explained later, but you're uh, multiplying every element with the Lorentz factor, right? Like that's what you're going to find in the end. Yes. But wouldn't there be other ways to keep it mathematically invariant without having it physically invariant? I don't know what that means. Like. Couldn't you put any arbitrary factor in front of it and it would still, from a math point of view, be invariant? Yeah, I mean, we, we, we don't, sorry. Well, like, is this there an actual way to prove that the Lorentz uh, Lawrence con uh, contraction is the only factor that keeps it invariant? Um, yes. Okay. We are going to prove this during the, this. I mean, uh, it, it, phrased in a different way, this is one of the exercises for the tutorial. This oh, okay. Now it's a good question. The question is: Is this so? The claim is that if, if you assume this, that you find all the rules of special relativity that we have already found, plus extra rules, these Lorentz transforms and the loss of simultaneity and such. And in, I'm paraphrasing your question now, but the question now is: Okay, but is this the only? Are these Lorentz transforms and such the only way? to make sure that this works? And the answer is yes. You will find this during the tutorial. It's phrased slightly different, but, it, but the answer is yes. So we're going to take this as our postulate. If you find that strange, why should the Pythagorean theorem have a, this strange minus sign in time? Uh, again, go to your philosophy professor. This is our, going to be our assumption. Something has decided in nature that this is what the space-time looks like. This is the rule that space-time obeys. And in, with every theory, you have to start somewhere. This is going to be our starting point. Now, the reason that I like this starting point more than the speed of light starting point is, um, first of all, I'm not making any claims about light. I'm just making claims about space and time and their, their, their relationship. 
And a big point that we made during the tutorial A of last week was that I said that if you're going to think that special relativity only comes about because light has strange properties, you're going to run into trouble in every situation where light doesn't play a role at all. Because then you think, wait a minute, if, if, it, if it hinges on light being strange and there's no light in this situation, then how, how come special relativity applies? So now you understand. It's because it's a property of space and time itself. It's only historically that Einstein found it by looking at light. But that was only accidental, if you will. I mean, there's this one first experiment or this one first idea that brings you to it, but then you find that there's a deeper law. So he found it by using the properties of light, but this is a deeper law. So this is one, this is why I call this the real derivation, because it brings it back to really the deepest fundamentals of relativity, space and time itself. No light. Yes. However, there should be C squared there. I knew that somebody was going to say this. Now, meter squared, Natural meter numbers. squared, meter squared, second squared. Can you add meters in seconds? Oh no, that you cannot. That's just out of units. You cannot me add meters in seconds. So that means you're missing a velocity somewhere, yes? Now for the people with, who think that I'm not sort of smuggling in all these things that we already knew about light, I'm not. Although I'm going to be suggestive. In order to make this also be meters, or meters squared, a velocity has to be there, agreed? Now, again, I'm not smuggling secretly in the speed of light, because first of all, I have not said what the value is of this c. I have not said it's 300,000 kilometers per second, that's one. Secondly, I have not said that light goes with this velocity. Thirdly, I haven't said that anything in nature goes with this velocity. Fourthly, I haven't said anything about this, this number having to be the same for all observers. So if you will, the only thing that I put in there was some conversion factor to make the units come out right. I've made no claims about physics. I haven't said that light goes with this velocity. I haven't said how fast that velocity is. I haven't said that it has special properties. I'm just saying there should be a number there. Otherwise, the units do not fit. So all the original assumptions about the speed of light having to be the same for all in the observers and such, no claims whatsoever on that level. Right, there needs to be a velocity. Maybe nothing in nature follows that velocity. Maybe it's just a conversion factor without any physical meaning, but it has to be there. Good. So if you were making notes of this, make sure that the c squared is there. Here, this will also have a c squared by definition. Yes. This left side is just how you call the thing, has a special symbol, we call d tau, and d tau also comes with a c just by convention, by definition. Now, before we're going to derive everything from this, this new postulate, let me make some claims, some statements, some easy ones that we can immediately do without having to do the other math. Namely, do you recall that in normal Euclidean space I could trade a certain amount of um, of uh, y and getting back extra x? According to this rule, I can make the amount of space a little smaller if only I at the same time make the amount of time a little bigger. Yes? It's literally the same rule, but just applied to space and time now. Does it sound familiar, making space a little bit smaller at the expense of making time a little bigger? It's literally Lorentz contraction and time dilation. You can make the amount of meters a little smaller by going to another rotated system at the expense of the seconds. Then you have to have more seconds. That's time dilation. So you can already sort of see these rules are in there somewhere. This is why I made that point that the original one with x and y means that you can trade in x and get back a little bit of y. Here you can trade in space and get back a little bit of time. In fact, you could even make it so that the two events, the two exploding firecrackers, are both of them on the x-axis and not on the time axis. What does it mean physically if both events take place at the, at the space axis but not on different places at the time axis? That they take um, place at the same time. That they take place at the same time. That means they are simultaneous. But in some other coordinate system where I've traded in a little bit of x and got back a little bit of time, that means the two firecrackers do not explode at the same moment in time, mm. right? That is the loss of simultaneity. So already you can sort of see this rule will give you everything that we already knew. 
in a glance you can see it gives you time dilation, it gives you Lorentz contraction, and it gives you the loss of simultaneity without all the fuzz of thought experiments and travel times and such. How are we, speaking of time, how are we now? I really need a clock here somewhere. Well, it's 12. Six, yeah, I think this is a good 12. moment. What we're going to do after the break is going to go to take this as a starting point, derive everything that we've already seen, but now in a thought experiment less way and a light less way. And then we have the real derivation of special relativity. Man, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, people, I propose we uh, continue. Again, I could. Uh, it, it, somebody just waves his hand at the moment that we're close to uh, the end. No clock here anymore. Um, if someone's going to wave up his hand in the next 10 minutes or so, I, I, I know you want to get out of here, okay? <laughs> <laughs> We're going to do the math. Uh, this is the idea. We have replaced Einstein's original assumption that came from, if you recall, Maxwell's equations from electrodynamics, and we've replaced it now by this thing that Minkowski noticed. Remember Minkowski, the math teacher, looked at Einstein's work and said, I think I, everything that Einstein says can be written as geometry of space and time itself. That's kind of a bold statement because, well, Einstein came up with a lot of results and all of them should be in here. Not only that, what should also come out if you want this to be really equivalent to Einstein's original thing is that if you start with this, math, 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 you should at some point get this back out, right? If it is going to be the same physics, then this should be the result of this. This is going to be the end of, th of this lecture. Like you see that it really ultimately boils down to the same thing, and therefore this, these are really two equivalent approaches to the same physics. Now, let's start at the top. First of all, this guy here, just for nomenclature, the d tau, Proper time. Do you remember what proper time meant? Do you remember from our equations for time dilation of last week? Proper time had a very specific meaning. There's many delta t's in relativity, but one of them deserved its own special name, proper time. What was what was special about that particular delta t that it got its own name? Yes. Proper time is the amount of time that happens between two events that happen at the same location. Yes? That's, that's by definition what we mean by proper time. Can you see that this d tau, this number here, must be proper time? If you use that definition, proper time is the amount of time that happens for two events, or the amount of time between two two events that happen at the same location. Can you see that from this equation that this must be the proper time? All four dimensions all are in time on the other side. Well, yes, the it, it, that means it's a time. Yes. Okay, but, but is it the proper time? The distance, as we said, the proper time is the time where the two events happen at the same location, so there is no x component. Correct. If you have two so exploding firecrackers, two events, and they happen at the same location, that means for that particular observer, the dx and the dy and dz are by definition zero, agreed? So that means in the particular coordinate system in which the two events happen at the same location, the amount of time is exactly this number. So this number is really the proper time. So that gives you some in interpretation of what the Minkowski line element means, what the number means. Even if you are not in that guy's particular coordinate system, if you have a different coordinate system where the x, the y, the z are not zero, then you know that that particular combination is still the amount of time for the guy who is in the coordinate system uh, for which the two events happen at the same time, uh, same location. Uh, it just makes it easier to talk, that you understand that the left-hand side really is just the proper time that we introduced last week. All right, so this is what we call d tau. It's just a Greek letter t, it literally just means the time. Okay, now. Should we derive time uh, time dilation from this? Yeah. We have a couple of them to do. We have time dilation to do, um, Lorentz contraction, the bigger set, Lorentz transforms, and then we're pretty much done. 
But let's start with time dilation. Let's see if we can get time dilation that we used to get from this. Let's see if we also get it from here. Now, if it were time dilation, we are looking for this formula, right? Any person's de delta t should be gamma delta tau. That's a time dilation formula, where delta tau, right? This dt was the amount of time for the person who sees two things happen at the same location, by definition, proper time. So we have to get, we have to take this guy and get this out. That's the idea. So it's a question mark, really. Can we get this out? Well, let me just start out by writing the variance. Uh, if it's okay with you, I'm going to stick to one space dimension. You don't have to, right? Uh, but I'm going to take two events that happen along the x-axis. I don't have to. I can also make a new coordinate system in which some of the events happen at x and a little bit at y. It just complicates the writing. And as we saw from Euclidean space, you're always free to rotate it such that the distance is the same. Distance, remember this? That even that you can always rotate your space coordinate such that the distance between two events stays the same. If we have this freedom to begin with, let's take that freedom to make sure that the two events that we're going to look at are both at the x direction. You don't have to, all coordinate systems are fine, but the nice thing about having the two events happen at the same uh, x uh, location, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, at the same y location in C is that you can drop these for now. So, here's one coordinate system. So I'm going to take two events. Sure, make it two exploding fire trackers if you want. In some guy's coordinate system, it looks like this. Again, in that guy's coordinate system, I've made sure that the two events uh, happen at the same y and z, so I can just drop these for the time being, just for writing's sake. <laughs> now, there's another coordinate system that I'm going to give a prime, and by prime it just means some other coordinate system. And because this is invariant, this number is different from this number, that number is different from that number, but this particular combination should be the same. This is why there's an equality sign in between. Yes, that's exactly what the invariance means. Are you okay with the primes, or should we just should we have a, A's and B's, or suns and ships, or something like that, underneath, or Alitsas and Raquels? I'm going to stick to the primes for now. It just means some other person's coordinate system. All right. Now, let's take one of the two coordinate systems in which the two events happen at the same location. Why? Well, we're looking for time dilation, and it only applies in that case. So let's go to that case, where the amount of distance between the two events for one of the two observers is zero. Now, you name me a preference. Which of the two is that? Either the prime or non-prime. Dx. Prime. Sure. Take this guy. This was not a physics lesson, it's really just how should we label things, okay? There's two exploding firecrackers. Let's make things visual. There's one exploding here, and there's one exploding here, okay? Now, I'm standing here, and I'm watching the two firecrackers explode, bang, bang. To me, they do not happen at the same location. But there's a second guy, and that guy walks along exactly at the moment that this one explodes, bang. And at the moment that the second one explodes, he, is, he makes sure that he's at that location. So that to, to that guy, the two explosions take place at the same location. Okay? We've introduced now two observers. One stands still and looks at the two firecrackers, and one makes sure that he runs just fast enough to see the explosions happen to him at axis zero. He just crosses the explosion at the moment that they explode. Now you said, well, let's take uh, this bad guy to be the guy who's walking towards from one firecracker to the next, this guy. So what is the X for that guy? Yeah. Zero, right? By, by, by construction. He makes sure that he walks just fast enough to make that happen. So, by the way, the two events are, in this case? Firecracker one exploding, firecracker two exploding. Four. Right. Firecracker one explodes. And the second firecracker explodes. Again, 
one of the observers is going to, by construction, make such that he sees and explodes at the same time. That's this guy. So that means for that guy, that means that dx is by construction is zero, zero meters between the two explosions. His dt, well, it's, it's not zero, right? But what I do know is that his dt is what I call d tau. It's by definition d tau. So the dt is some number, and it's not zero. Good. This is one observer. The second observer, well, has some other number and has some other number for both of these. Now, what I'm not going to put in is the rules that we derived last week, because then I'm smuggling, then I'm using circular reasoning. I'm using the rules that I want to prove mm. by putting in the rules that I want to prove. So I don't know anything about these numbers. But I'm going to play a little bit, because I'm going to take these thingies in, into my invariance statement. Then what I get is the left-hand side, this one, becomes... I get this, right? I've now used the invariance of the Minkowski line element. This is all physics. Now let's do a little bit of mathematics. You see, I can play around a little bit with my mathematics here. What if I do the following? Do you agree with this? This is wrong, actually. This is it. Do you agree with this? It's not physics, it's just mathematics. Mm -hmm. I, I literally just took out the dt squared, put it outside of brackets, yes? Now, what I see here is a distance divided by an amount of time. That, that it's, it's like a velocity, isn't it? Be careful now. It's a velocity. If you want to have the formula for time dilation, you're looking for not just a velocity, you're looking for a specific velocity. Going back to the guy standing here and the guy walking towards the firecrackers, what is the velocity in the time dilation formula? There's a V in there, yes, in the gamma. What <coughs> V is this? The velocity of the person walking. Yes. The velocity of the person walking with respect to the, the guy standing still. Now, so this V is really just the velocity between the two uh, uh, observers. We have to be really sure, you have to check these things. Just because you have a distance divided by time doesn't mean you know exactly whose velocity it is. So we really have to check this. Now, the amount of meters, the x prime, um, the x prime is measured by the guy standing still, right? And how, ma how much time there is between the two, f how much space there is between the two firecrackers is seen by the guy who is standing still. Here firecracker, there firecracker, this is the x prime as seen by the guy who is not moving towards the firecrackers. The t prime is how many seconds there are between the two firecrackers as seen by this guy. But since the other guy is exactly by construction at the location of the explosions a piece, that means this v is also the velocity between the two guys. I'm making a strong... Uh, you, you might think that I'm harping a little bit too much on this. Oh, it's a velocity. Of course it's a velocity, because there's only one velocity in this, in this situation. You have to be careful with these things. You really have to check that the velocity, that the velocity that you're looking for is really the velocity that you think that it is. If it is the amount of space between the two firecrackers and the amount of time, but the other guy happens to be walking exactly towards the firecrackers at the moment that they explode, then this is also the, the, the amount of x how much the, the second guy has walked compared to the first in this amount of time. So it really is the v between the two observers. Having said all that, I get c squared minus v squared dt prime squared. So all of this talk was just to convince you that this v isn't just any v, it really is the, the, the amount, the, the velocity with which the two observers are walking with respect to each other. We can make one more nice mathematical step. Again, 
just mathematics, algebra, divide it out to C. This is wrong. That's this. Then we take the old red marker of cancellation. So what I've gotten ultimately is D tau. Follow the algebra. <coughs> Looks like time dilation because this is what we call gamma. So, what I found out is d t, d t primed is gamma d tau. Is that the time dilation formula? Oh, you're going to find out that c is actually the speed of light. Uh, not by this argument because I haven't said it's the speed okay. of light, it just says it's the speed. Some, some unit has to be in, in there to make sure the units are yeah, okay. Yeah. We found this formula now, yes. And it looks like time dilation because one time <coughs> equals gamma times the other guy's time. Is the gamma the right place? Remember where you should where you should put the gamma according to our derivation of last week. With the proper time. Yeah. Yes. The gamma goes in front of, of the, the, the guy's time who sees two events happen at the same location, which in our situation was this guy that we called D tau. So yes, we have actually found time dilation directly from this thing. No thought experiments, no light, just algebra and geometry. That's nice, isn't it? Time dilation checked. Good. Speaking of time, half an hour. We still have an hour. Good, good, good. Now. The next thing that we have to check, right, we have checked that this statement by Minkowski really gives you back time dilation as you already knew it. But we also have Lorentz contraction. In other words, does this claim over here also give you back that L equals 1 over gamma L, where this is the proper length? Let's call it L0. The amount of distance as measured by the person who stands still with respect to the thing of which we want to measure the distance. This also comes out of that, but that's an exercise for the tutorial. See if you can make that work. Okay. You have to think a little bit harder for this one to make sure that this one works. So let's see this afternoon if you can get that out. Great. So let's assume that you've done that. Yeah, it's easy to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so suppose that we've done this, and that means that up to this point, we have rederived all the special relativity that we have seen last uh, week, but now by different means. So I think we can cross this off. But here's the big promise. In this derivation here, we had to assume that one of the two observers sees the two for exploding firecrackers at the same location. In our thought experiments last week, we had to assume the two events, the bouncing of the light against a mirror, happens at the same location. The question is, are these the only two space-time tricks that make sure that this is invariant? And the answer is no. What we really have checked now is that if you have time dilation and Lorentz contraction, then this invariant. We've proved it the other way. We've taken the invariance and proved that Lorentz contraction time dilation is true. But are there more rules? Are these the only two? And the answer is no, there are more. I'm going to do this here. Again, I'm going to write down the invariance of the Minkowski line element. This one here. Again, I've made the events happen at 
the same y, the same z for both, so I don't have to carry along all the dy squares and dz squares. Feel free to put them in if you want. Just cost more paper to write it out. We have a mathematical question here. The mathematical question is t, or this dt really, is some mathematical function of this dt and this dx. Yeah? This is what we have here as well. This dt prime is a function of the original dt. Namely, take the original dt, multiply it with gamma, and you get a new dt. Lorentz contraction. One guy's dx is a function of the other guy's dx. In this case, put a 1 over gamma in front. The point here is, the dt's for one guy can be written as some mathematical function of the dt's of the other guy, and the dx of one guy can be written as the mathematical function of the other dx, and possibly that you need both the time and the space for both. In this example, not, because we by definition said, well, one of the guys has dx is zero, so might as well leave it out. But the bigger question is, but is there something, a bigger rule that you also get to take into account that the two events do not happen at the same location for one of them? That there is a dx non-zero for both of the two observers. So there's really two questions if you think about it. Is there a mathematical function which allows you to calculate the amount of time between two events in this frame, if you know the amount of time and space in the other frame? That's this question. Second question, is there a mathematical function that allows you to calculate how much space is between two events, if you know the amount of space and time in the other guy's frame? It's a mathematical exercise. So, after you've gone to your philosophy professor to ask where this comes from, you can go to your mathematics professor and ask, please solve this exercise for me. Please find all the functions, these two, that make sure that this is correct. Or, if you will, that this is correct. Now, there's two ways of doing it. I can assume that I don't know the answer and start driving it for you. That takes about an hour or so. It's not difficult, but it just takes a while. What I can also do, I give you the answer, and you put it back in and check for yourself. Yeah? There's, really, there's two ways of solving an equation. Either you use a mathematical trick and you found the solution, or somebody gives you the solution and you put it back into the equation to see if it fits. For time constraints, I'm going to do the latter option. If you want to see how it is derived in a different way, I can give you some hints and pointers, and you spend a rainy Sunday afternoon, and you can find this for yourself. I'm going to give you the answer. Here are, here's the answer to this question. Do these things exist? If so, what do they look like? Here's the answer. If you want to know the dt by one guy, you take the dt by the other guy, call him prime, and you subtract from it the other guy's amount of distance. Uh, I never know where the c's go. Uh, v over c squared, there you go. This is good news. This means that if you have two exploding firecrackers, and you have two observers, and for neither of them do they explode at the same location, right? In our previous example, there was one guy who just made sure that he exactly was at the right spot for the second one to see it explode at, at his position zero. Now you have another guy who doesn't, who is not that, that, that clear, he just randomly walks around, <laughs> not with the right velocity. So he doesn't see the two firecrackers explode at the same location. That guy, Right, he just walks here, sees one of them explode, Brandon he walks around, he's certainly not at the right position to see the other one explode, at his position zero, sees the other one explode, he measures the distance, that's the x prime. He measures the amount of time, that's dt prime. And then you want to calculate, knowing these two numbers, what the guy who was standing still all along, how many seconds for him there was between the two exploding firecrackers. That's this equation. You can take the amount of distance and the amount of time of one observer, and relate them to the amount of time of the other observer, even if none of them see the two events happen at the same location. 
the non-same location of this effect, that this thing is not zero anymore. Okay? That solves this one. How about the amount of space? Suppose that you know of the randomly walking guy how many seconds he saw between the exploding firecrackers and how many meters there was for him. And you want to know how many meters there was between the exploding firecrackers by the guy who was standing still all along. That's this equation that we're looking for. And again, I'm just going to give it to you. Here it is. That's this one. Everybody clear on what these equations mean? I mean, we haven't derived them, I'm just postulating them. But are you clear what they mean? Yes, so just saying it out loud so I try to understand better. So dt is the time of an observer based on a different observer's time and position. Correct. And then you put the gamma in order to change it so that it's in their reference. Uh, yes, the okay. gamma obviously has to do with going from one to the other, but you are absolutely correct. Okay. If, if you and I are moving with respect to each other with, with a velocity v, mm -hmm. and you, you look at two things happening, mm -hmm. in my example that's always the exploding firecrackers, you've measured how many seconds you saw between the two exploding firecrackers, that's this number, mm -hmm. and you also tell me how many meters there were between the two exploding firecrackers, that's mm -hmm. this number, mm -hmm. then you can calculate how many seconds I saw between the two firecrackers. Mm -hmm. You use this equation, put in your numbers, and you immediately know how many seconds I saw between, two, between the two firecrackers. Mm -hmm. That's what the formulas do. Yeah. They allow you to take the dt and dx of one guy, calculate the other guy's dt and dx, even if none of them see things happen at the same location. And this is all because of Euclidean geometry? Uh, well, Minkowskian geometry. Of the, main the, the fact that this is invariant. Mm -hmm. So that's what the meaning is of these equations. Now, I haven't proven it, yes? So how can you prove that this is true? Math. Yes, yes. <laughs> obviously, yes. <laughs> Please do not write this down in your exams, okay? Mm -hmm. Do math. math. <laughs> how would you prove Now it's just algebra. I agree with that. At the moment that you take this guy, yes, and you would put it here, and you take this guy and you put it here, then the left hand side becomes this complicated uh, e expression in terms of dt prime and dx prime, yes? Then you work through, yes, you're right, then work through the math. And if you then have cleaned up the left hand side, you will get exactly right hand side. And that proves the, the claim. Again, there's two ways of doing this. One of them is by not knowing the answer and trying to work your way towards it. You can do this, but it involves hyperbolic sines and cosine functions. It sounds more difficult than it, than, than it, than it is. Um, you, because of time constraints, I'm going to let you in the tutorial just do this exercise for yourself. Put this in, check that it, that it, that it fits. If it fits, then you have now proven that these are indeed correct expressions that make sure that Minkowski's postulate is upheld. Here's the beautiful news. These two equations, those are the famous Lorentz transforms, is the complete rule book for special relativity. Yay. Yay. So now we just do brain yoga on the left side. Yeah, so we have four weeks brain to go, yoga. five weeks, so we're we'll <laughs> we just going to sit around and do nothing and drink tea and tell jokes. <laughs> um, here's a question. So, uh, by the way, we really, I mean, I'm not joking. This is really the, f the complete rule book. We have the rule book now. Now, there's two things that we still have to do. Because we have now used this. We saw the time dilation came out. We saw that uh, Lorentz contraction came out. Well, you're going to show it in the tutorial. So that means that at the very least, we have found two-thirds of what we saw last week. We found a little bit extra. But what we have not found yet is that last week, this came out. In order for me to show that this is really equivalent to that, I don't just have to show that the same results come out, I really have to show that this thing leads also to that thing. Then I've shown that it's really the underlying mechanism. 
So let's end this lecture with doing that. Can I erase this? Yeah. So again, two thirds, as in the time dilation and the Lorentz contraction of last week, we have seen that also comes from this, but we have not shown that the postulate of last week, the last third, that, that also <laughs> comes out. So that's going to be how we're going to finish this main lecture. Let's define a velocity. Let's take a person, let's take a coordinate system, x, y, or so. And let's say that there's a floating mass. Any particular object that you are a fan of, doesn't matter what it should be. A vacuum. A vacuum? <laughs> <laughs> you mean a thing that, that sucks up? Yes. <laughs> okay, okay, I, I was... I, I was no, I, I vacuum, no, I like it. Okay. <laughs> sure. A vacuum cleaner. Okay. No, because it's been no risk. Because <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to talk to Yako and, and ask him what a vacuum is, he has very different interpretations of that. Yes, it's it's it's, 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 like it's, it's the space that 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 doesn't just contain no particles. Uh, uh, anyway, it's a long story. In particle <laughs> physics, the vacuum of one guy, if you Lorentz transform to another vacuum it's not the same vacuum anymore. So this is why I thought, I hope you're not going in that direction because we have to pull in a lot of part of quantum mechanics to make that work. The vacuum cleaner. There's a flying vacuum cleaner, okay? All right. Now, there's one coordinate system. I want to know how fast this vacuum cleaner is flying with respect to me. Now, this coordinate system in the black, um, how do I calculate the velocity? of the vacuum cleaner. I'm not going to call it V. We've reserved V up to this point as the, the velocity between observers. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the velocity of a vacuum cleaner. How do I calculate the velocity of the vacuum cleaner? It's high school physics. X over T? Yes, but I would call it delta X because the X okay. is a position and you want a distance. I'm really, really a little puristic about this, but it's really different things. Mm -hmm. Special relativity makes no claims about x's or t's, only makes claims about dt's and dx's. Yeah, of course, it's yeah, the amount of meters that the vacuum cleaner has flown divided by how many seconds this guy in the black system saw it fly. Okay? Now, here's the second person. This guy, this time, the, the second person is not sitting on the vacuum cleaner like I was last week on the broomstick. He has his own corner system in the red, and the black and red corner systems have a relative velocity of v. Yes? <laughs> now, mind the different velocities here. V is the, 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 the relative velocity between the guy in the red system and the guy in the black system, how fast they move with respect to each other. U is the amount of velocity that the vacuum cleaner flies with respect to the black guy. I also want to know the velocity with which the vacuum cleaner flies seen by the red guy. I call the going to call this W. Give me somebody know a formula for this? W is V minus U. If this were Newtonian physics, life would be simple. You would say, well, if the black guy sees the vacuum, cle vacuum uh, uh, cleaner fly with 10 meters per second, and the red guy moves along with the vacuum cleaner with 2 meters per second, then in the red system, the vacuum cleaner co goes with 8 meters per second, right? But that will be Newtonian physics. I am not sure whether that rule holds here. We have to derive it. So if this were Newtonian physics, you would expect uh, this to be true. Sorry, real quick. So yes. the... W is the velocity of the vacuum cleaner as seen by the red guy. Correct. Okay. And U is the velocity of the uh, vacuum cleaner seen by the black guy. If there's a Newtonian physics, you would expect that if you know how fast the vacuum cleaner is going to the red guy, and you know the relative velocity between red and, and black guy, then this would be the velocity with the, with the vacuum cleaner. The question is whether this still holds. The answer is going to be no. <laughs> because relativity. Because of relativity. Because relativity. Also, <laughs> do not write that down on your exam. Don't write down <laughs> math or because relativity. That will not get you two points. Okay? But do you know a formula for this? How do you calculate in high school the velocity of anything? 
you take his position and take the derivative? You're correct. You can take the position as a function of time, take the derivative. Or, which is equivalent if it's going with constant velocity, it will be this one. Correct, yes. You look how many meters a vacuum has flown in the red system. We call that delta x prime. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I can drop the prime, by the way, because I already have black and uh, red to differentiate them from each other. But I'm going to keep them in anyway. Okay? Good. So we have a formula for both. But are we taking into account that the, that the red coordinate system is also moving? Uh, it is moving with respect to the black person, mm -hmm. yes. Yeah, velocity. so don't we have to include also that in the W? It will automatically. Okay. But at this point, I'm just saying that if I want to see how fast the vacuum cleaner is flying, I have to see how many meters it flew, <coughs> delta x prime, divided by how many seconds it took as seen by the right person. That's this equation. Okay. Now, what I would like now is to have W express as a function of u, that if you tell me how fast you see the vacuum cleaner fly, then I can calculate how fast it flies with respect to me. In Newtonian physics, again, there will be u minus v. So is there any way that you can think of that, that I can relate the amount of meters as seen by the red guy in terms of how of the black guy and the amount of seconds as seen by the red guy in terms of the amount of seconds by the red guy? Maybe there are some equations on the board that do this for you. Those are more sense one, right? If you know how many meters the red guy measures, you can convert it to the, ama the amount of meters that the other guy sees it fly. That's exactly what this, this equation tells you. In fact, because of the, how the way that plays the primes, let's do it here. I'm going to take the black one. Uh, going to replace the black guy's dx by the primed ones, the red ones. So, the numerator, what should it be? I know the amount of meters in the black system, I want to have it in the primed system, the red system. What should I write? Just for the dx. Gamma dx prime minus v dt prime. I'm going to take my Lorentz transform that tells me that this guy's dx mm -hmm. can be written in terms of the other guy's dx and time. With this formula, that's this one. I'm replacing this uh, by this. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And these dx prime and dt prime are the ones we've defined, like. In the with the formula for W or no? Uh, it will come back in a moment. Yes, we're not there yet, but we're oh. close. Yes. How about the denominator? The amount what I have here is the amount of time as seen in the black system. I want to have it written in terms of the amount of time as such in the. Uh, I mean it right, but I say it wrong. <laughs> we have the amount of seconds as seen in the black system, and we want to have it in the red system. So the same thing. Yeah, it's like this equation, right? That's exactly what this equation tells you. It allows you to take one guy's dt and turn it into the other guy's dt. So, we're going to take uh, this one as well. Put in the formulas. Uh, dt primed minus v of c squared dx primed. So far, so good. I've literally taken what my Lorentz transforms do for me. It allows me to take them some guys dx and turn it into some other guys dx and take some guys dt and turn it into some other guys dt. Why do I do this? Because I want to have this u, the velocity in which with which a vacuum cleaner fl uh, uh, flies in the black system and turn it into something relating to the red system. Now, so far the physics, put the Lorentz transforms in. Now I'm just going to use some algebra, gamma's dropout. Of, by the way, can I just divide away a gamma mathematically? Mm -hmm. Gamma is the numerical yeah. value, right? So yes, as long as it's not zero. Yeah. <laughs> yes, no, you cannot divide to zero. But gamma is either one or bigger. No problem there. Okay, so the gammas have dropped out. Okay. 
So I have this now, yeah? Again, what I want ultimately is something that will contain a W, this W. Because I want to have the velocity of one guy expressed in the velocity of the other guy. That's my plan. But we're close because, look, we have dx primed here. And if we only would divide this by dt primed, that will be a W. So I can sort of make a W in here if I just divide the numerator by dt primed. Let's do that. dx primed, dt primed, minus v. dt primed. This is algebra, no physics. Just took a dt primed out. I do this because I've now made a w here. Good. Now let's do the same thing with the denominator. Well, the same thing, right? I have a dx primed here. If only that were divided by dt primed, I would have had a w here. So let's do that as well. 1 minus vc squared, dx primed, dt primed. This last step, all of this, just algebra. The red marker of death. Drop out, as long as they're not zero. Uh, say something more positive. Let's use the, um, the green marker of replacement. <laughs> not of life. Of life, sure, why not? <coughs> dx primed, dt primed. How would you call this? The amount of meters that the vacuum cleaner flies is seen in, in the red system divided by the amount of time is seen in the red system. W. Well, that's u. Is it u? No, not w. Oh, w. Yeah. This guy is exactly the velocity with which the vacuum cleaner flies as seen in the red system. Same here. So what do I get? I get w minus v. 1 minus v over c squared w. There you go. If you have given me how fast you see the vacuum cleaner fly, that's w. I put it into this formula, I get how fast I see the vacuum cleaner fly. That's what we've now calculated. You can take your velocity with which you see something move. Turn it into my velocity with which I see the same thing move. If I put my hand here, this is what Newtonian physics will tell you, isn't it? If you know how fast you and I are moving with respect to each other, and you know your th that guy's velocity that he sees a vacuum cleaner, just subtract our relative velocity and you get my velocity. But relativity apparently tells us no no no, it's all it's like this, but not that quite. Is this a big number? V W over C squared? C squared is really big. Really large. C squared is big, right? And as long as vacuum cleaners, that's W, do not fly close to the speed of light, <laughs> and V, that's the two guys, do not clo <coughs> fly close to the speed of light, then this is a small number. So that means approximately this is true. This is why it works with cars and such. By Newtonian physics, velocities work with cars and you know everyday objects. But if we would replace the vacuum cleaner by something that goes very fast, like ships going to Greece, then all of a sudden, new rules apply. This has a name. <laughs> it's called the Einstein Velocity Addition Rule. It tells you how you can make one guy's velocity into some other guy's velocity, taking into account full relativity. All clear in the meaning of this thing? If you know you how fast the vacuum cleaner flies with respect to you, W, you can calculate how fast it flies with respect to me. It's almost like Newtonian physics, W minus V, but with some extra stuff. The extra stuff is typically small. Final step. So this rule applies in special relativity we're going to use as in exercises. But we promise to go here. Let's do the following. Let's replace the vacuum cleaner by light. Something that goes with C. So this rule applies for all vacuum cleaners or light, it doesn't matter. 
but let's apply to light specifically. I'm going to look at how fast light flies, and I will say it will. It, to me, the light goes with the velocity w. Yes. So I am going to see the light move with c. W has now been replaced by c. Then this w also becomes c. I get v c c squared. I'm just applying the rule, but I'm just using that one of the two observers sees the vector cleaner move with the speed of light. W has to be replaced by C. Let's do some algebra. V minus C minus V. You get this. Let's do some more algebra. Just algebra. I put W, put it into C, I'm looking to, at something that goes to the speed of light. Then I get this. I can take a C out here. Then algebra tells me it looks like this. I take the red marker of death. If I see something move at the speed of light, you still see it move at the speed of light. See that this comes out? Have you seen that it doesn't even matter how fast you and I are moving with respect to each other? Because the whole Venus drops out. It doesn't matter what our respective velocity was. So what we have found now is that C is the same in all inertial systems. It doesn't even matter which V, how fast two people are moving. For all people moving with respect to each other, they will all see the same speed of light. Exactly how Einstein started. That's so cool. Isn't it? <laughs> yes. The, there in this um, line element, we did not say that C is the speed of light. Agreed. There we I agreed. I'm smuggling a little bit. Algebraically, is correct. But when I started this, I said that this has to be a C in there, a velocity. I never said that it was the speed of light. I still haven't said it, actually. I mean, I, in my talking, I say speed of light. But I'm just saying, if you have a C in here, some velocity that has to be in a <coughs> for Sorry. unit reasons, then whatever moves with that C will move with that C as seen by everybody. So <coughs> we have found out that the C that we have put in is invariant. I still have not made the claim that it is light that actually moves with this speed. I mean, I'm saying it in my, in my verbal delivery constantly because I know that it is. But do you see that I'm not using light itself? I'm just saying, if you have a C in this theory placed here, then all observers will see that same C. Now, what does? How can we check whether that is actually the speed of light? That doesn't follow from that that one, right? It just says you have a C, and all people see the same C. That's what we have now found. I haven't said that it is the speed of light, even that it is light, even though I constantly say it in my verbal delivery. How but, can you tell? But even though there you have, like in the denominator, you have first C and then you have over C squared, and yes. this C squared comes from the line element which we did not say and this the other c comes from you saying that it's the speed of light and there you then cross them out how about this i don't want to replace my vacuum cleaner not by a ray of light but i just say a vacuum clean a vacuum cleaner that moves with this velocity yes then the conclusion still holds even though i've not specified that it is light moving so what we have now found is that this Minkowski postulate gives you that there is an invariant velocity in nature. It still hasn't told you what the value is, it still hasn't told you what moves with that velocity, it just tells you that this velocity, whatever the number is and whatever follows uh, this velocity, is going to look the same for all observers. Now experiment will have to tell you whether A, there is something that moves with this velocity, and B, that it is light. So this is where you can say, and then people did measurements on, on electrodynamics, and people thought, and people saw that it was of all the things that could have moved with C, it is actually light that does it. So, in this way, we've made full circle. Started here, got time dilation, got Lorentz contraction, e and even found Einstein's original postulate. So, really, we have really made full circle. We've really shown that Minkowski's postulate really is special relativity in a different way, geometric way. 
So just yes. a quick question. So sure. we've defined that there is a velocity that is invariant, yes. but no, not found a value for that yet. And then the value for that was actually found experimentally, or, or is yes. that also proven mathematically? Uh, no, no, you cannot, from, from just this positive value, you cannot tell what the value is. Right. The best thing you can do is say that it has the unit meter per second. Mm -hmm. But you cannot tell that it is, first of all, that it's 300,000 kilometers per second. You cannot tell that light moves with it. But you can tell that it is invariant. Mm -hmm. You have to do go some some mathematics, but you can't prove that that is the case. Again, full circle. We have special abilities to be built up in a new way, and as we went along, we got the Lorentz transforms, and we got the invariance of C back. All right, that's it for now, I think. Are you going to post how you went from there to there? Uh, it's an exercise. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, we can go to it with the tool. Thank you. Yeah, that was crazy.